Auditioning for anything is a humiliating experience. I've prostrated myself for radio and television, public service announcements and instructional videos. If any of you have tried it, I'm assuming a lot of you have, <laughs> I commend you and extend my condolences. There is something existentially confusing about being paid to pretend to be something you are not. Can you try it with a little more energy? Like you just had a triple shot of espresso? Absolutely, sure, no problem. I love coffee. I'll give it a go. <laughs> OK. Now, as if you're a little distracted, like maybe you're trying to figure out if you left the iron on. Sure. I'll try. OK. Maybe now a little aloof. If you insist. There's also usually an awkward moment when the folks conducting the audition start talking about you in the third person, as if you're an abstract concept and not a person. I've heard comments like, she doesn't look like she'd own a poodle, does she? Do we need to get a stronger looking dog? Or, she's kind of not pretty enough to be the wife said in a stage whisper. Can we switch and have her read for the friend? Casting calls are outside the realm of polite society. There are live action Twitter comments and you are voluntarily at the mercy of this audience. You are selling your face, smile, hair, height, and perceived age, all for a price you've agreed to in advance, minus 15%. To call it selling yourself sounds harsh, but at least it's an honest transaction. It is also usually mildly too severely weird. It's a space where bizarre request must be greeted with an enthusiastic yes, of course, rather than the more natural response of say what now? Once I was at a casting for a voiceover commercial. We recorded numerous versions in various styles to appease an indecisive client who wasn't present but would be reviewing my disembodied voice along with a few other contenders for a seasonal radio spot. The job would have been a decent score. It paid in the low four figures and if the spot performed well enough, I could have received an extra paycheck with no additional effort. I stood alone in a small, too warm, padded room wearing stiff, oversized earphones. And I began, as I began what felt like take number 2,654. Butterball brings you the joys of Turkey Day. <laughs> Friends and family drop in to bask in the warmth of the season. Celebrate this summer with Butterball Turkey on the Grill. Tender, juicy, surprisingly simple. Happy Thanks Grilling from Butterball. <laughs> the skinny producer wearing 90s acid wash denim wrinkled his nose as I finished. Okay, this time brighter, like turkey is your favorite dish and you were rushing off to the store, you know, like maybe to buy cranberries. You can't move a lot in the booth because of the microphone but I leaned forward on my tiptoes and imagined being a little giddy as I said, Butterball brings you the joys of Turkey Day. Okay, this time, like you're feeling sentimental, the holiday reminds you of your dad, who died. He was always the one who carved, carved the turkey. He won't be there this time, but he'll be there in spirit. <laughs> but don't forget to sound upbeat. <laughs> um, sure, of course. I will put a little heaviness into my voice, but with a smile, because my dad, who died, would have wanted us to have friends and family drop in to bask in the warmth of the season. Okay, now, like you're laughing. Nope, trying not to laugh because your kid is dressed like a turkey and he's trying to show you his dance moves, but you're talking on the phone so you can't crack up. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so I'm uh, stifling a laugh and maybe giving off a knowing chuckle 
because we're going to celebrate this summer with butterball turkey on the grill. Good. Um, I, I think the client would also like some options to appeal to a diverse audience. Cool. <laughs> Say more. Uh, one of the spots will be geared toward more of a black, I mean African-American, audience. Oh, <laughs> great. Uh, so maybe a little regional southern dialect to warm up the ending. Happy things grilling from Butterball. The producer grimaces, sucking air through yellowed teeth. I am not dismayed. This is what they pay you for, making the sometimes unrealistic ideas in their head a reality. Can you uh, give us a take with a little more character? Character? <laughs> uh, you know, you, you don't have to pronounce everything so precisely. <laughs> Maybe think about how you would say it to a group of black, I mean African-American <laughs> friends, <laughs> if that helps. It does not. But this is the early 2000s, at least 10 years before Cheerios got in trouble for portraying a mixed race family as normal doing a Super Bowl ad. It was a time when it was trendy for black people to bust out a rap in commercials while eating cereal, ordering fast food value meals, and playing with toys. Okay, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> Butterball brings no Butterball brings But damn it. How does a black woman say butterball? Or more precisely, how does a black woman who is in fact a black woman say butterball in a way that is convincingly black for two not black people staring expectantly from behind soundproof glass. It is a soul bruising affront to be judged inadequately you. I mean, pretending to be something I am not, a doctor, a small business owner, a mother of two, a lacrosse coach, that's acting. Pretending to be a black woman, and failing? This is more than an existential crisis. It is vexation at its finest. It is also wildly ironic. There are very few situations in which it is financially advantageous to be more black. Resumes by candidates suspected to be black are routinely judged as inferior to resumes with the exact same credentials by candidates assumed to be white. Homes occupied by black families have been professionally assessed as less valuable as the exact same home occupied by a decoy white family. Code switching exists for this very reason. The term usually refers to camouflaging blackness. It is fairly basic black wizardry. It manifests in ways that are shocking, skin bleaching, cosmetic surgery, and minute language, like using the generic endearment buddy instead of brother. It's saying, you make a very fine point, instead of, I fucks with that. <laughs> Although, for reasons that are very debatable, there is, in fact, a detectable nuance in the resonance and cadence of most African-American speakers. You can probably hear it even in my voice. Studies found that listeners could reliably identify the race of black speakers, regardless of dialect, with, 80, with over 85% accuracy in less than 10 seconds. If listeners heard a one second clip, a single word, they could still detect the race of African Americans two out of three times. So with odds like that, my musings about how to blackly intone the word butcher ball were not necessary. 
I do wonder if my life would be different if I sounded like the producer expected a black woman to sound full time. Because sounding black in America is not benign like sounding Canadian. In those studies that I mentioned earlier, once participants identified a voice as black, they were asked to describe how they thought that person would look and behave based on their voice. Not surprisingly, a black, rich male bar baritone was perceived as having bolder black features and demeanor. Tall, muscular, broad nose, full lips, tightly coiled hair, abundant melanization, and probably large gold chains. <laughs> a friend of mine had that kind of rich black male voice. He surely would have ranked in the 90th percentile on the black scale. I heard him before I ever saw him. It was at a coworker's house party, and he was an invitee I didn't know. My back was turned when his silky bass tones vibrated against the canals of my ear like a low, whispered growl. I thought, surely a young James Earl Jones had, had snuck into the room. I was mid-sentence when I turned around to locate the brother who owned that cool voice. But I didn't see him. I must have frowned because whoever I was talking to asked what was wrong. I shook it off. Then, a few seconds later, I heard that voice again. And I was not shy. I turned 180 degrees this time. <laughs> he must be sitting down or standing behind that white guy in the lavender polo shirt. Then I realized the voice belonged to that white guy. <laughs> I chuckled. He must have grown up in a black neighborhood, I thought. And I went back to my conversation. Mystery solved. Later, I learned the name of the, I learned his name was Nathan. And that Nathan sounds black because Nathan is black. His dad is black. Blackity black black, as Nathan says. His mom is white and inherited genes are a funny game of roulette. Nathan embraces his black identity, but he did not look obviously or even subtly African-American. He looked like your average white guy, but in a recording booth, hmm, no one would have ever challenged him to try a little harder to prove his blackness, even though his appearance would have surprised them. I thought about rehearsing a black voice for voiceover auditions. I know the sound. We all do. It's a distinctive cadence of smooth and sass with a hint of fuck around and find out. And truth be told, maybe I could have put a little honey into my voice and dropped in a little bass to give them a taste of the flavor they were after. But would that have been enough? Or did they want, woo child, this turkey show is good. Yeah. I did not want to fuck around and find out. I never tested out a black voice at auditions because my version of a black voice is currently coming out of my mouth. <laughs> Using race to categorize humans is fairly new. It began in the 16th, 16th century, for obvious, 17th century, sorry. For obvious reasons, it has become a shorthand for prejudice. Black Americans are part of the most imitated culture in the world, but we are also among the most pigeonholed. Reg readily and effortlessly celebrated as a black actor, musician, athlete, or fashion icon, but not the black scientist, university president, astronomer, or billionaire CEO. At its core, code switching is the don't ask, don't tell of race relations allowing black people greater access and acceptance if we meet certain criteria. The guys in the recording booth were breaking the first clause. They were asking me to switch back, just for a little while, to what they suspected was my real speaking voice. They were surely unconvinced that a neck roll was not part of my normal speaking repertoire. And I'll admit, 
I do speak differently in a room full of black people. <laughs> different phrases, different intonation. If I was only talking to the black people in the audience today, this story would be different. Not unrecognizable, but different. However, given the demographics of this room, you'll have to trust me on that. <laughs> anyway, as you probably guessed, I wasn't cast in that Butterball commercial <laughs> or any voiceover commercial that ever required me to sound like someone who looks like me. I was cast in a television commercial in which I appeared to be a black female who was a pediatric nurse or the owner of a coffee shop, or a person who cares about saving money on her auto insurance. <laughs> Sometimes these were non-speaking roles, which obviously worked in my favor. I may have never succeeded at sounding like a black woman for voice auditions, but to be black in America is often defined by double standards. Double standards that the population misusing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s quotes would insist do not exist. <laughs> Race is more than skin color. For black people, it is defined generally by a set of shared cultural experiences, not all of our own choosing. Some of those experiences require us to have a flirting awareness of a number of inside jokes and cultural references to Big Luther versus Skinny Luther asking who made the potato salad, Janet Jackson's character on Good Times, old school R&B lyrics, and a raging debate about whether you season your grits with sugar or salt. Salt and butter is the only acceptable answer to that last one. But to be clear, don't start. There is no one way to be black. Nothing hold true for all. We are tall and short, wealthy and destitute, light and dark, conservatives and liberals, Jewish and Mormon artists and astronomers, rock climbers and knitters. And we each say butterball in our own unique way. <laughs> Thank you. Deborah Bass! <laughs>